a rare pleasure indeed to uh, welcome someone of his uh, considerable national stature as an author, an editor, and a, a constant advocate for atheism and free thinking. He uh, is closely shows, if not the editor, of uh, Free Thought magazine, which comes out monthly and is eminently worth it. If you want to find out what's going on in this country in regard to free thought, humanism, atheism, or anything else, this is one of the leading publications, and I highly recommend it. Uh, Dan uh, comes to us uh, via, um, and, and thanks to the Christian Church, <laughs> where he started out as a teenager um, and became an, a, 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 an associate pastor and pastor of uh, several churches in uh, California. And um, so he amassed an enormous amount of experience there and did an enormous amount of thinking about um, problems raised by uh, re religion. And uh, I think we will be the, the beneficiaries today of some of that thinking. And um, if not, he has several books that are available, more than a few actually, uh, and each of which is eminently worthwhile. So I hope you'll join with me today in welcoming Dan Barker. Thunderous applause. Now. Yes. Can you hear me? You can hear me okay. It, it, you turn it up a little bit, maybe if you can. Can you? Can you do that? Can you hear me? Is that better? Oh, that's, that's much better. better. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, good, great. I have this fancy equipment here. <laughs> we do our we do our radio show, our national radio show, from this room. Ah. And our our engineer Buzz Kemper. Uh, has set us up with these nice interfaces and things. So, um, so, and we have good quality microphones. So the, the good quality of our radio show is not a miracle. It's all due to science. Well, what a pleasure to see everybody. Annie, Laurie, and I just got back from Milwaukee. We, I was afraid I wouldn't make it back in time. Uh, we were doing some um, volunteering for a homeless person there in Milwaukee. And it was our first actual trip anywhere uh, since the pandemic. Can we so, download the program? Download the program. How many times? Download the program. What program? Talk about program for the show. Should I still be talking here? I hear somebody talking. Hello. Um, I assume you can still hear me. <clears throat> um, yes. Yeah, sorry, I so, muted. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. This is this is a free for all. This is this is like life. <clears throat> so, uh, as I was introduced, I'm co-president of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, a national organization. And most of you know about us. We focus on the legal side of state church separation, with now ten full-time attorneys, plus extra legal staff and some legal interns. So we have a very busy legal staff complaining about state church violations and uh, suing, taking litigation about it. And that seems to be our main focus. And that seems to be what people know us for because you've heard the old saying, when all is said and done, usually more is said than done. So we, we would like to turn that around. We would like to talk, it's great to talk, but we wanna do things, we wanna make a difference. We want to actually challenge the religious right and challenge the dangers of religion. But um, our second purpose, besides working for state church separation, our second purpose is as an educational group to educate the public about the views of non-theists. I think about 90% of our group call themselves atheists. Uh, the last survey we took, it was around 90%. The rest like, like the word agnostic, and some call themselves uh, secular humanists or deists or, or some don't want to call themselves anything. They're just igtheists, they say. And at the Freedom from Religion Foundation, we say we don't care what people call themselves. We don't want to get into that fight about are you or not a really a true atheist. <clears throat> uh, we like the word free thought. Free thought is sort of an umbrella term that includes atheists, agnostics, secular humanists, and other non-believing types. Uh, we even think somebody like uh, Thomas Jefferson or Thomas Paine, the deists of the Enlightenment, although they were not atheists, 
we like to think they would want to join a group like ours too, because the, in their daily lives, if you look at Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson and some of the other deists, in their daily lives, they could be described as practical atheists. They didn't go to church. They didn't pray. They didn't read holy books. They didn't contribute money to religion. They didn't do any of the rituals of religion, and although they did have some ideas of maybe there was some kind of a prime mover or an early force. Uh, so uh, the Freedom from Religion Foundation uh, doesn't really care, although we've been called, and, and we don't reject this, we've been called an atheist group by the media a lot, and that's kind of true, because we do, we do have mostly atheists and we stand up for atheists. But we like the word free thought, and you saw a sample of our newspaper Free Thought Today, which started in 1983. And we also have a national radio show, Free Thought Radio, which just this, just last month, the last week of April, we celebrated our 15th anniversary of Free Thought Radio, which is not just a podcast, it broadcasts on, on radio stations around the country. And we like to, we don't want to just preach to the choir, we want to reach out to the world. And uh, it, it then becomes a podcast. So a lot of people like to schedule the podcast so they can hear it later. And we have many thousands of podcast listeners around the world. But we really like broadcasting. Sometimes we'll get a, a letter or an email from somebody. A truck driver was driving down the highway and said, hey, I heard your show on the radio. How do I join your group? So that's really cool when that kind of thing happens. We also have a TV show called Free Thought Matters. And we always end the show with, by saying, thank you for watching Free Thought Matters because... Free thought matters. And that is broadcast on television in about a dozen major uh, television markets, reaching about, about a quarter of the US population on Sunday mornings. It's the unsermon. And uh, I, I got a letter from a woman in um, the Denver area. Uh, her husband is disabled. And even before the pandemic, they were not able to go to mass. But their church in the Denver area broadcasts mass every Sunday morning, like from eight to nine. And so the two of them sit and they go to mass by watching the broadcast. Well, immediately after the Catholic mass, our show comes on. So the couple stays to watch our show too. And she goes, well, that's different. <laughs> she, was just, she was just doing the, the mass and the whatever Catholics do on Sunday mornings. And... Um, and then, she, and then they stayed and watched our show. And she said, well, that's really interesting. I never knew there were people who cared about not believing. If you don't believe, why don't you, if you just don't believe, right? But uh, I think what a lot of religious people don't understand, and I would not have understood this either when I was a preacher, is that for many of us free thinkers, atheists and agnostics, our non-belief is just as special to us as their belief is to them, whatever the religion is. And my wife, Annie Lori Gaylor, is a third generation free thinker. She's never went to church. She never was raised religious. And to her, it's an identity. It's like she wants to be a part of a group of people that mean something. And we think non-belief is a double negative. Uh, you know, atheism, the word atheism is a, it starts with a negative, the A, which means without or lacking. But we think it's a double negative. And there's a lot of words in our English language, in many languages, that are actually positive terms, like independence is a double negative. It's not dependent. So we think of independence as a positive thing. Uh, nonfiction, we think of nonfiction as the truth. Uh, an antidote, we think there's a lot of words like that. And I think atheism and free thought are very positive, meaningful things to us, not just because of what we don't believe in, obviously, but because that monkey's off our back. It's like, it's like saying, hey, I'm out of debt now. That's a good thing. You may not have any money in the bank, but if you're out of debt, that's, that's a good thing. So um, <clears throat> then uh, uh, Free Thought uh, Matters, we talk with state church people. We talk, we've had five members of Congress on Free Thought Matters, uh, including Eleanor Holmes Norton, who was, who was lobbying for DC to become a state. And she even has a, a, a American flag with 51 stars on it, just in the case that happens. You know, Congress just passed it again, but I don't think Senate's going to still go for that. In any event, um, mem members of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus we've had on, and then uh, television actors, movie actors, uh, attorneys, uh, activists, uh, personalities. 
And if you don't get free thought matters in your area where you can turn on the TV and watch it on Sunday morning, uh, you can just go to YouTube, FFRF, Free Thought Matters playlist, and you can see all, I think there's 120, 130 shows there now. Uh, this week, uh, we talk with, um, uh, who do we talk with this week? I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think this morning it was Debbie and Dan Weissman, the Weissman family who took that case in Rhode Island back in 1992 about uh, prayers at school graduations, and they won. She, uh, Debbie was just a teenager in school, and now, of course, almost 30 years later, she's still proud of that case. And you can watch her and her dad talk about, boy, and the pushback they got and the flack they got from taking that case for state church separation. The Freedom from Religion Foundation now has 35,000 members. We started, the group started, is a local group in 1976. And Ann Gaylor started the group with her daughter, Annie Laurie Gaylor. And uh, it, was, it was almost, it, they, they wanted to do things. They were, they were protesting uh, women's issues. And Ann Gaylor was the first, first person to write an editorial in the state of Wisconsin in favor of abortion rights in the newspaper. So she was pretty known locally or in Wisconsin area as a feminist you know, firebrand. And so they were going to a, a, a city council or a, maybe it was the county board meeting uh, downtown Madison to protest something about women's rights, saying that in Wisconsin, cows have more rights than women, they were going to say. But before the meeting started, a priest got up at this secular meeting and opened the whole thing in prayer. And Anne realized, well, wait a minute, our women's biggest enemy is the church. The church is always fighting women's rights. And here we are to testify about women's rights. And then there's a priest up there on the podium with, with all of the leaders. And so she put down her notes and she started, she complained about that. She said, why do you have state and church mixed together? They should be separate in this country. And after the meeting, a reporter came up to her and said, um, so tell me more. That sounds interesting. You're protesting. And eventually they got it stopped. They got the practice stopped. And uh, the reporter asked her she's, and said, so are you... Um, like, who are you? Are you a group or something? And she said, well, we're just a bunch of people that want to be free from religion. We're free, you know, freedom from religion is important. And he said, that's your group? And she said, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> so he put it in the paper. There's a group of people who want freedom from religion. So she started getting phone calls. And, uh, you know, you, you remember typewriters and, and three by five cards at a dining room table. They started a group with three people. Today now it's 35,000 plus people all over the country. And we are the largest free thought organization in the US. We are, we've been told we are the third largest free thinking secular group in the world next to the uh, humanists of Norway and then Britain. They have, they have an advantage because they get tax money to help them. So, but, but next to them, we are the third largest in the world of what you might call atheists and agnostics. So, um, it's a blast. I came out of the ministry, as you heard, back in 1980. Well, I became an atheist in 1983. I left the ministry in 84. So there was a time when I was in the pulpit a few months as a horrible hypocrite. I was still preaching and not believing it. And then I finally sent out a letter in 1984. And you can read my story in the book, Godless, how an evangelical preacher became one of America's leading atheists. And, uh, you know, my missionary work, uh, evangelistic work, uh, church pastoring, Christian songwriting. I wrote a bunch of Christian musicals and songs, and I'm still actually getting royalties today from some of that music back, written back in the 1970s. And I worked with Gospel Light Publication, you know, VBS, Vacation Bible School. They would put out these programs. I wrote three, two, I think, maybe three of their uh, Vacation Bible School musicals. <clears throat> and um, in fact, one of the women who worked there, their main editor, she's now an atheist. And so we're comparing notes how we both came out of the ministry. That's pretty cool. Um, and then uh, I joined the Freedom from Religion Foundation as a member in 1984. And in 1987, I joined as a staff member. There was only three staff members then. And uh, we worked, you know, it was, it was, it was nonprofit pay, but it was, a, it, was, it was a blast. And just kept plugging away, fighting the religious incursions into uh, into our government, and then educating. We publish books, and we, of course, we have our, our newspaper and radio show in that. 
And uh, then uh, when Ann Gaylor retired as president in 2004 or 2006, I'm fuzzy now, then Annie Laurie Gaylor and I, we became co-presidents back then. And uh, Annie Laurie and I, we met back actually in 1984 on Oprah Winfrey show. And you can see it online. Uh, just, just do an internet search for Oprah Winfrey, um, maybe Barker, Gaylor. And you can, you can see that first, that September 1984 show where Annie Laurie, you can see the day we met. A few years later, we got married. And so we actually have a video of the day we met each other, which is pretty neat. We showed our daughter years later and she was laughing. Um, not, not because we looked so young, I had all that hair and stuff, but she was laughing because that audience that Oprah had picked were all these Bible thumpers. And um, if any of you saw that, you know what I mean. One of the women called Annie Laurie a witch, the devil's in you, young woman. She was just promoting feminism and, and free thought. And uh, it was a great show. It was great TV, I think, because she had this differential between atheists, real live atheists on the stage. That show, if you ever watched it, it was the very first time I had ever spoken publicly about my atheism and if you watch the show you can see me groping for the words i'm like thinking it i'm thinking about those phrases for the first time that i'm putting them into you know into words today it just flows out natural but uh, i was still just out of the ministry and i was you know you can see me struggling to find those words i used the word delusion by the way during that show long before richard dawkins wrote the god delusion and i told him about that i've been saying delusion long before you like that's supposed to mean something, but um, but it was a delusion, leaving the faith, leaving the ministry, and having to reconstruct a life. Some of you know what I mean. You were true believers. Some of you don't know what the heck I'm talking about or we're talking about. Andy Laurie has a hard time grappling with why would somebody believe in the first place? If it's not true, then just don't believe it. But she does know that for some of us, it was really a psychological thing. It was really tough. It was really... Uh, you don't just wake up one day and snap your fingers. Oh, silly me. There's no God. Ha, ha, ha. You can't do that if you were raised in all these habits of mind and all of this, all these thought patterns that take a while. It's kind of like other major traumatic life experiences, like maybe a death in the family or going through a divorce or some other thing where your brain takes a long time to get over that. Well, that's long gone for me, but uh, some of you know what I'm talking about, that there's real freedom in... Well, that's, that's a tautology, isn't it? There's freedom and free thought uh, where you can actually be free to think for yourself, make up your own mind. Like Thomas Paine said, my mind is my own church and my country is the world. And my religion, he said, is to do good. And I think most of you would agree with that. We're biological animals in a natural environment. We want to live, we all want a world that has less violence, less harm, less pain, more well-being and so that gives us our meaning and our purpose and our joy in life being able to do that so um so you know i used to be a preacher and i could preach for two or three hours if you want but i think since this is just a relaxed informal meeting i think i'll just stop there and let you maybe ask questions if you want to uh, about anything i said or anything else maybe uh, you want to ask okay so uh Hi, David Van Ness already has his hand up, so please go ahead and unmute and ask your question, David. Hi, Dan. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, been a member of the FFRF for about a dozen years, and I really admire you and Annie Laurie for everything that you do. Um, Thank you. You know, I belong to uh, several free thought organizations, both uh, statewide and national, as well as the FFRF. And <clears throat> almost without exception, except for the FFRF, the past few years, they've all been struggling. <clears throat> and uh, FFRF has been thriving. So I wonder if you could tell us why you think that is. And also, is there any advice that you could offer to other free thought organizations that uh, would help them attract more members, especially members willing to roll up their sleeves and you know really get involved? So yes, we are thriving and we're doing well. And even during the pandemic, we didn't have to lay anybody off. We, we kept working remotely. And in June, we're gonna go back to our building. We expanded our building five or six years ago, really nice five-story building in downtown Madison, a couple of blocks from the state capitol. And I think we're doing well because for the, for the same reason that you joined, 
there was something about us that attracted you to want to become a member. And um, I would guess, or maybe I'll let you say, why was it that you joined? Probably because you saw that we're actually doing things. It, it's great to talk. It's great to have organizations that, you know, but we don't just sit around talking, no, there's no God, there's no God, no, there's no God. And we want to do something. So maybe you can tell me, I mean, we yeah, have 30. Um, well, I felt, and I think this is part of it is that I felt threatened. You know, I, I was, I'm tired of religion getting the free pass on everything all the time. And uh, the views of secularists and free thinkers is being disregarded and, uh, you know, treated so that we don't matter. And I saw you guys doing something about it. And, um, and I think a lot of the, uh, and that's, I think people today maybe feel less threatened. Maybe you can address that, but maybe that's why the, uh, like the AHA and so forth aren't doing as well as they were in the past. Um, maybe people just don't feel as threatened right now or, or, uh, disabused by, <laughs> by uh, religious institutions and so forth. Well, I don't know about that. I think there are a lot of threats, of course. Uh, we are members of the AHA and we admire the AHA uh, for all, and they have a legal branch too. And their attorneys and our attorneys are collegial. You know, it's, a, it's the kind of thing where I think a lot of you, don't just join one group. It's not like a church where you just join one church. A lot of you have joined all the groups. You want to get all the literature. And so it's not like we can add up the numbers to get a right. total. Um, we, uh, we all want to help each other the way we can. Um, I, I, I think it's good news, bad news. And this is just my own armchair idea that it's obvious that religion is diminishing. Religion is weakening. Church attendance is now less than 50% for the first time since Gallup has been taking these polls. And we know that church attendance is even exaggerated. Uh, it's usually about twice. It's usually twice as much. So if, if less than half say they go to church regularly, then uh, that they belong to a church even, then uh, take half of that. Um, but I think that's a good sign. Young people are much less religious now. Like uh, under 30, about a third of them are like totally non-religious. Um, so looks like the United States is finally catching up with Europe. You know, Europe went through these centuries of religious fighting until finally, now most Europeans are pretty, pretty secular. They have these beautiful, gorgeous, empty churches over there that point to their past. And I think that's starting to happen here in the United States. Of course, I don't have the gift of prophecy anymore. Who knows? <laughs> but, uh, but the bad news, I think, is that the religious right knows they're losing. They have lost and lost. All these major fights, they keep losing, 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 losing. Uh, birth control, abortion rights, gay marriage, a prayer in the schools, creationism in the schools, you name it. Uh, um, religious symbols on public property. They keep losing, 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 and losing. And in spite of the fact that the current Supreme Court is, is more friendly to religion, I think the religious right just knows that they've lost, they've lost the culture war. Maybe they think there's some hope in the courts, but they've lost the culture war, especially among young people. And so they hate it. They hate that they are no longer the main thing in this country. And it may be like a wounded animal out in the forest that knows it's dying and it wants to take everything down with it that it can as it's dying. And I think that's how I would have felt as an evangelical that, well, yeah, we're losing, but we're going to, we're going to go down fine. So in the short term, I think they actually are pretty dangerous because look what's happening in a lot of States, uh, which they used to call it project blitz. We still call it project blitz these religious rights attempts to just flood state legislatures with these in God we trust, uh, Bible in the school bills and so on, creationism bills. By the way, the one in Arkansas just died in committee to allow creationism to be taught in the schools. So um, we have a part of our organization is what we call strategic response team. Andrew Seidel, who's one of our constitutional attorneys, he and some of our staff, work on strategic response, which is basically lobbying and, uh, and bills and that. And we have a full-time lobbyist in DC too, Mark Dan. 
Uh, Ryan Jane, who's one of, the, of our strategic response team, says he's tracking about 800 bills right now. They have software that tracks them all over the country. There's about 800 bills that they are tracking uh, by mostly by the, this project blitz that is trying to just flood, hoping that they get enough through. They're trying to blitzkrieg the thing. That was a poor choice of words, but uh, that's, I think they stuck with it. And of these 800 bills, um, I forget what he said. I think maybe 15% of those are good bills, actually. Some of the bills are good that are being proposed to stop discrimination uh, you know, on uh, gay rights or whatever. But there's an awful lot of bad bills that are being thrown out there. And so I think to answer your question, uh, we have a lot to worry about. And I think you all see that. And I think with the makeup of the court now, we're waiting any day for decisions, some important decisions from the Supreme Court, where they have just, they're pretty much erasing a lot of previous state church precedent, and starting back with the Trinity Lutheran case and with other cases. Um, so we're going to have to watch and we're going to have to fight and we're going to have to keep complaining. And there's nothing stopping you in Florida from complaining about any Florida legislation. In fact, some of you probably do. A lot, most free thinkers, at least the ones who join our group, they're active. They write letters, they do the phone calls, they contact their member of Congress and they protest. They, some of them show up at the meetings to let their voice be heard about certain bills. So, uh, and we actually have action alerts where our uh, communication staff is, can send, if there's a bill in Florida that we don't like or that we do like, uh, we can target members in Florida to say, here's, testify or call or send an email or do something about this bill. And we even give you sample wording and you can, then you can edit the wording if you want. In fact, it's better if you edit it. So it looks like it's not a format. So, um, so I, I think we're just going to keep on keeping on. Well, I'd like to say, if I hope I'm not hogging the, uh, the uh, stage here, but um, the AHA is not growing and maybe Judy can speak to this. I don't think atheists of Florida is growing. Uh, CFI isn't growing. Um, you know, uh, I think it, it does have to do with uh, the activism that you have a very clear, very clear uh, mission at FFRF and, and you're activists. And I think that has a lot to do with it. But um, that's what I meant by they're struggling a little bit. They haven't been attracting a lot of new. Well, maybe they're going through a down period for a while, um, but it could come back. It seems they're, to me. That, I mean, they're great organizations, Robin. Yeah, um, I was just going to say, it seems to me that young people don't want to join groups. And especially because most of <laughs> when these groups are older, um, you know, we have people come and then don't ever come back. And I, I feel like part of it is one, they don't see the, the direct threat of um, the government and religion intermixing because because they haven't been used to it. Like we grew up with it and had to fight it. But, but I think they're going to have yeah. to learn how to fight this because it's going to be imposed upon us um, and them, and them uh, rather severely in the next few years as the right wing, the, the Christian nationalists uh, get more vocal uh, and active, organized. organized. So um, we have a small percentage of our organization who are in their 20s uh, and a little bit larger in their 30s. But the average age or the median age of our organization is around 60 and about more than a third are retired. And we are about 60, I think two thirds male also, even though we've been for decades trying to get more women involved. In fact, it's some, many of our conventions is more females than, than men than male. <laughs> and um, we're also pushing for um, diversity. But um, so it's kind of a, a mixed thing. Younger people don't tend to have the resources and the time to commit to join a group. And it's, it's, it's people that are like my age, uh, in, you know, 60s and 70s, or maybe, maybe 40s and 50s, who see it, who have the perspective. And now at, at a point in life where they do have some discretionary resources, to join a group because who's going to join a group like ours unless you really care right unless and then you know we ours our dues are forty dollars a year and then most people give a lot more than that but uh, um, 
a, an advantage of having an older group, of course, is um, not that they have, not just that they have more resources. And this is kind of bittersweet, but uh, a big, a big chunk of our income each year is through bequests. So sometimes it's 15, 20% of our income comes from bequests, which is something you can't really budget. You can't, at least not, not legally. Uh, but um, so when you have an older group, then you have resources. And so that's kind of, kind of a mixed thing. You want the younger people. And with FFRF, it turns out that most of our involvement with the young people is giving to them. We have essay contests. We have six essay contests where we give out more than hundreds of thousands of dollars in awards uh, and scholarships to these essay winners. In fact, let, this last year, we had our first one in Puerto Rico. They actually wrote in Spanish uh, an essay in Puerto Rico and we gave out awards to them. So these young people, they don't have money. They, you know, they're trying to scramble together to go to college and maybe find a job. And so most of our involvement with them is to, to encourage them and to reach out to them. We work with the Secular Student Alliance, which is another great, wonderful organization. Uh, helping campus groups around the country, uh, high school and college groups. And uh, we have sort of um, uh, an informal arrangement with Secular Student Alliance where we are helping each other out, uh, mo mostly with resources to help them out with things. So, um, so yeah, and the young people today are going to join later. Many of our members today were young people who couldn't join in the past, but now they can. So we're building a solid base with the hope that once they get into their career or get more middle-aged, they will, they will come around and join the group. We wish the kids would join, but of course they just, most of them just can't. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I, that's what I see is why we should be encouraging young people because even if they don't like, we have universities, they have several universities here and they move away afterwards, but they take those ideas with them and try, and, and hopefully later that will blossom. Uh, Mark Brandt has a question. Thank you. Um, religion, along with politics, seems to be really emotional at its base. And uh, so it's difficult to uh, talk with people who are emotionally invested in religion. Uh, what sort of arguments have you found effective in uh, trying to get people like that to use their rational brains uh, to look at evidence uh, 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 regarding the issue of religion? Well, they have to want to in the first place. They have to want, to, they have to have a desire to want to reach out and think and learn and expand and be curious. And if they don't have that desire, if they're happy where they are, I think there's very little you and I can do. I don't think, at least for me, I don't think I have any need to convert everybody to think like me. The only time I feel like I have some imperative to take some action against those people is if their actions are causing harm. If they're denying medical treatment to their children, for example, on religious grounds, or if they're discriminating on religious grounds, well, then in that case, I think I think those of us who call ourselves moral have an obligation to step in to protest that. But if they're going to church and they love their church community and maybe they're even doing good things with it, uh, I I don't feel like barging into their church and yelling at them, "Hey, you stupid people, stop!" Uh, they have to want to, and so I think the only way you can attract people is by being attractive. I don't think we can browbeat them. I don't think we can push them. Maybe there's a few. I mean, there might be a few people that are way over on the rational side of thinking who are believers who might be impressed with that. Uh, I'm sure there are. But in general, I think if, if we think of it as sort of a standard distribution, there's a whole bunch of people over on this side of that curve who are just not, they just don't care. They're happy. They don't want to think too much about it. They're just they would rather let their seminaries and their preachers and their denominations do their thinking for them. That's the kind of person they are. And there's no way I'm going to jump over here and force You have to start wanting to think because if they don't want to think, they don't want to think. So when I do debates, for example, and I've done 137 public debates uh, and a lot of them are at universities, I know there's a small percentage of people that really are in the middle. That's who I'm talking to. 
usually people come to a bait, debate to cheerlead for their atheist, rooting for the atheist or rooting for the Christian. But usually there's some, maybe 15 or 20 percent in the middle who really are wondering. So I'm I'm talking to them. And in the three debates that I've done that have actually been graded before and after, the the statistic, the delta moved in my direction. Nobody went from a 10 to a one, but somebody might have gone from a six to a four or from a you know, from a seven to a three, they might have done that in their in their movement. So we can make a difference to those who want there to be a difference made in their lives. Uh, I guess the question is, how do we get them to that point? And I think just living an attractive life, a good life, a happy life, a moral life, a, an example, not that we have to, not that I've, that we have to preach to each other to live, you know, like virtuous lives or something. I mean, that can be like a religion, but just when they see, hey, Hey, my uncle doesn't believe in God. And look, he's really a good person. And look at my my sister. I didn't realize she doesn't believe in God, but boy, my sister. So I think that goes a long way. Just you can attract people by being attractive. And then it's up to them to make that decision in their own minds. And when they come to us, then of course we have lots to share with them, don't we? We've got gobs of material. Depends what they're interested in. Is it philosophy? Is it science? Is it morality? Is it history? Is it you know, you know, what, what is it that they're interested in? Is it equality? And um, so, um, and also I think you can, you can protest too much. I think if, if we look so eager and un, unhappy that we want everyone to think like us, well, that makes us seem kind of insecure, doesn't it? If we're trying so hard that we need everyone to think like we do. So a lot, I know a lot of atheists who are just live and let live. And uh, they don't feel any need to evangelize. Maybe I still do, because I used to be an evangelist. And there's room for that. Um, so I, I guess there's no one size fits all response to your question, Mark. Other questions? Well, there have to be other questions. How can there not be? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in with one. There's a, a bit of a... Um, of a controversy going on right now inside the AHA in regard to their recent decision to relieve uh, Richard Dawkins of his um, 1996 uh, Humanist of the Year Award on the grounds that uh, he wrote a tweet which uh, seemed to suggest the possibility <laughs> that, um, I don't know what, the, no, what that was about exactly, but it was a, a criticism of the, um, Transgendered people. Uh, um, Transgendered girls to, being able to play sports on on female. No, that's teams. that's the current controversy in the oh. in, in 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 the state. Actually, I but, thought that was no, I thought that no, anyway. It doesn't matter. Well, he wrote something. But at any rate, he wrote something, and they thought that it it, it was offensive. But for that um, error, if it was an error, uh, they relieved him of his award. Uh, what kind of thinking, if any, do you do you have about that? So FFRF does not have any official position on what AHA did. And you know, I'm, I am moderately familiar with it. I read for a, for a half an hour, I read uh, Richard's tweet and, and some of the responses. So I'm, I guess I'm the wrong person to ask about because I don't know everybody's motives. Uh, at face value, it looks like, it looks to me like Richard's follow-up tweet er erased a lot of the uncertainty there he might have he he probably said something um he probably could have said it better i guess but uh since since he's not an official part of fffrf we don't have any need to like say something official we all admire him of course for his work and his writings uh, for the wonderful contributions he's made and if we take him at his words he said he he's he's in favor of equality Maybe he's a little bit old school, old British school in the way he phrases things. And so that got him into some trouble. I don't know. Uh, but I'm, I'm not privy to the AHA's reasons. Maybe there's things that they know that I don't. So um, I guess I can't say much more about it than that. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to follow up on that a little bit too, because uh, this involves uh, a society-wide trend of um, cancel culture, what, what's generally called cancel culture, and uh, which is a, a kind of a hypersensitivity 
on the on the part of those who have uh, a minority status, like atheists, for instance. But but however, not hmm. not, not not that much. But uh, atheists, some of the leading atheists, in fact, have out. been uh, sort of canceled. Uh, people that that we all know and. Um, how do you think that that trend interacts with the existing um, atheist organizations and structure? Well, we're all different. You know, it's, you heard that old joke. It's like herding cats. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no one atheist position on a whole lot of things. We are not really, there's no, I don't know if there's such a thing as an atheist culture. There are local cultures, like your group is a local atheist culture. Maybe you would call it a culture. So I don't think there's any one way we would answer questions like that. I think there's different types of people. Even in our own staff, we notice different people who are more relaxed about things, people that are more upset about things, people who are super strong feminists and people who are just moderate feminists. So it depends where you fall in there, I suppose, how you're going to how, how your feelings are going to get hurt about these things. And we kind of feel like at FFRF, there's so much work to do that we will spend a minimal amount of time on these things. Uh, when another leading atheist a couple of years ago uh, was accused of actual sexual harassment, um, we didn't have to take any position because we weren't, that person wasn't a part of our organization or anything, but we did make a statement uh, about that, that, you know, of course we disapprove of actual harm, actual harm in these cases. But when people say things that are marginal or, you know, um, I'm, I'm sure some people got their feelings hurt with what Richard said. And I'm sure there's a lot of others who have said, well, what was the big deal? Um, FFRF of course is committed to diversity and equality and fairness and inclusion. And just personally, I have a, a granddaughter who's now a grandson and that's taking some getting used to i mean we all we all come from this culture of most of us are of that age where it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around that isn't it so this this granddaughter of mine is now a grandson of mine and i think that's really cool and my son and his wife are really happy with it so in the family our grandson is is fine but at school is getting bullied because culture and it, it's just tough for your brain after all this time of thinking about work, things in a binary way it's tough to readjust so rather than readjust me we want to readjust the world so um um i i guess before i say much more about that i would have to study some more um and we're all different and i don't think any one of us is going to tell any other atheist how you must feel about this uh, right. i think i think we can be chari as charitable as possible I think we can be as kind and maybe if we can borrow a religious uh, terminology, we can be as forgiving as possible when it, when it comes to that, because we all make mistakes. Uh, I make mistakes and you know, we all do. So, um, but that's just me talking. Thank that's you. a good thing to say. Thank, Thank you. you very much. JK has a question or wants a comment. So JK, unmute and go at it. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's nice to meet you, uh, Mr. Dan. So I just wanted to, uh, I just sent you a chat as well, a request. Uh, we are a nonprofit and we are uh, running some talk shows and some projects on that. We invited like uh, even uh, the God virus famous like uh, Daryl Ray. Uh, and uh, to that point, like my question is, uh, how is that like possible uh, when you say that like, uh, uh, to convince or make other people uh, us to be attractive as an atheist. Because when you talk about religion, now it has become a business, right? For me, like every other religion is a stronghold business, a traditional business, uh, which cannot be uh, uh, superseded or it cannot be uh, eradicated. Like, So how do you think that like uh, uh, the other, uh, they, they are like, every religion is like kind of a monopoly, uh, a big monopoly corporate and uh, a small uh, business like atheist, how they can be attractive. Can you enlighten me on that? If that's a right question I ask. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not a business expert, but it seems to me that if a business 
succeeds, it is meeting some needs or wants of their customers. And uh, religion tends to do that. There are customers out there who need or want something that this group is offering to them. Of course, I think it's kind of like uh, salvation is offering to solve a problem of its own making. Uh, how much respect should we have for a doctor who runs around cutting people with a knife so that he or she can sell them a Band-Aid, you know? I mean, they're creating the problem and then they're pretending to solve the problem. Um, if we're going to talk about a business model, then I guess in a free market of ideas, the, the thing to do is just drive them out of business. Make, uh, make uh, and you can do that through state church, uh, take away advantages that they get from the government. If, uh, you know, if they're getting too much government handout, uh, maybe we can challenge that. Or if we can educate the young people to no longer see value and, and no longer have the need or the want for this product that this business is selling to them. And that's already happening. I, I don't think any of our groups can take much credit for that. That's already happening, especially with the internet. Younger people are just, they're just not interested. And one is the main reasons why church membership is going way down now. So, um, <clears throat> so I don't know. <clears throat> Maybe if we can offer something, if, if we're a business looking at it that way, if we can offer a product that people want, then they would be attracted to have what we want. So, um, so I don't know. I, I don't think we can barge into the churches, but I do think that if they come to us and they say, how can you be an atheist? How come you don't like the Ten Commandments? How well, then we are ready to, there's a Bible verse that says that, be ready to give an answer to any man who asks you a reason for the hope that lies within you. So we can be ready to give an answer for anyone who asks us uh, a reason. I, I think we have very, very little chance of success by just walking up to somebody on the sidewalk and start proselytizing them. Hey, you should give up your faith. I think there's very little chance of that happening. It might, who knows, you might hit somebody at the right time in life. Um, my brother, Daryl, was a Christian, but he was kind of a lukewarm Christian back in the 80s. When he saw me, his big brother, come out and say I, that I'm an atheist, it suddenly gave him permission. He went, oh, so Dan's saying he's, oh, and he's a humanist. Well, me too. I've always thought these things. I never, it's almost like he didn't have permission to think those things until he saw someone else say them. So you yourself just being open and talking, can, you can actually be giving permission to other people to think their own thoughts because we don't want to control their thoughts. You don't want your thoughts controlled. You want to think your own thoughts. That's what free thought is. So, um, you know, I, I hate to sound like a preacher that we should all go out and evangelize by letting our light shine before the world so that people will see that. But that kind of does work with, with some people. I, I think that kind of does work. They're just, they didn't know they were waiting to see someone else with the courage to be different, to speak out and say they don't believe. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, JK, did you want to, uh, AK, did you want to follow up on any of that? Uh, no, I'm good. Like I thank you again. Uh, I'll let others to ask questions. Okay, thank you. I see like so many hands. Bill thank Northworthy. You. Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and first, I would like to compliment you on the uh, beautiful offices you have there in Madison. I have been there, and I even had my picture taken with Charles Darwin. Ah. I yeah. had no idea he was staying there. <laughs> He's standing there. If you haven't seen it, it's a life-size right. uh, likeness of Charles Darwin that looks real. It's scary. He's standing yeah. there. And for, for a few months, whenever I would walk by the library where we have him, I would look, who is that? Now I got used to it. But uh, when you first saw it, and you probably thought it was a real person. And yeah. um, you can get your picture taken with Charles Darwin. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me. So sometimes I'll stand next to him and I say, Charles, have you got any new thoughts that are better than the uh, natural selection? And he doesn't say anything. That's so, the best thing so far. So far, he's, I guess when he comes up with something else, he'll let us know. Well, that's good. Um, actually, my question for you is your very unique background, not, not totally unique, because there are others who have made the journey you have from uh, evangelical 
Christianity to atheism, but I'm curious about the difference between your organization, which focuses on a national scope and tries to deal with problems when needed at the local level versus what most churches are, which is very local specific uh, uh, com congregations that people rely on for lots of things besides religion. And uh, so what, what's your perspective on where our movement, the atheist free thought movement is in terms of uh, national scope versus local organization? So we primarily view ourselves as a national group dealing with legislation, with laws and policy. And that's, that's been our focus. We do have chapters. I think we have about 20 or 25 chapters, including uh, the Central Florida Free Thought Group with David Williamson and them. Maybe some of you are a member of that group as well. Very active, uh, successful chapter. And, um, but Freedom From Religion Foundation is not trying to be a church alternative. That's not our goal. We, we allow for chapters. If, some, if, if a chapter can't help but come into existence, then we allow for that. But we're not out trying to plant, you know, how religious denominations are planting churches all over the place. They send out, well, we don't want to do that. Uh, we think instead of top down, we think it should be bottom up. What, what the people at that level want to do. And we can accommodate that bottom up. And we've had some great chapters over the years. Uh, and many of them are involved in, in charitable work and local work and community work. Uh, chair and uh, maybe helping the homeless or uh, here in Madison, we've done a number of things. Uh, we helped to build one of the homes for the homeless, for example, that's out on the east side of town. And so other chapters are doing that as well. And your group is probably involved in, in similar things. But uh, right now we don't have the numbers. Just think of how many, think how many churches there are all over the place. We were driving through Milwaukee yesterday um, and there was a church on every third corner. They were just everywhere. It was just incredible, especially in some of the poorer parts of town. There's this sort of this uh, contradiction here and, and Jeremiah Kamara wrote, did a whole movie called Contradiction in that the, the poorest, most depressed parts of town are the towns that, that place to have the most churches. Why is that? And the big, more better off parts of town have relatively fewer churches. So um, we don't view our group as that. We know there's other groups that do that and we applaud that and we help that in some cases. And um, I think most of you don't need to be told the value of charitable work. You're probably all involved in some cause or other that's, that's dear to your heart that, you, that really motivates you, volunteering or giving or, or whatever it is. With Annie Laurie, it's, it's feminism and helping women. And Annie Laurie and her mom started a group called the Women's Medical Fund, which helps, helps poor women, mainly to pay for abortions. They don't have access to abortion. But um, so I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know if atheism, which is a bottom-up kind of thing, could ever really take that model of a top-down planting groups all over the place. I don't know if that would work. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Maybe it's more of the kind of thing the government, since we're all in the government, the government can have policies that can help people from the top down, which seems to be the, the direction that Biden is leaning right now, more towards government helping people rather than trickle down kind of stuff, uh, economics, but um, <laughs> I'm no, I'm no expert in any of that stuff. Ask me about the Bible. I'll tell you some. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jenny? Um, myself. Yeah, I just need to unmute. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know what order we were in here. So um, I just wanted to comment about Dawkins' choice of language, um, which I know, I know some people in the trans community and they really found it hurtful. Um, they don't feel that they are choosing a different identity. They feel they are who they are and they'll tell you which gender that is. But it's, it, it, they, don't, they really are, don't like the f idea that he said that trans people are men who choose to identify as women and women who choose to identify as men because to them it's just not a choice it's just who they are inside and allowing that 
allowing themselves to be their true selves. And so in that way, they are trans. Well, I understand that. And I think you're right. But I do think there's a choice. There's a choice of whether you do want to come out, even though you did not choose to be who you are. You could choose to continue living as a female. You could do that in, the, in your culture. And people have. There have been people who have been miserable in their lives by choosing to live according to the way the culture has forced them to live. Or you can choose to go against the culture and choose to come out and be who you, who you are. You didn't choose to be that, but you can choose to be open about that. So there, I think with my, my grandson, I call him a grand, grandson now, uh, there, there was a choice that was made. Do I still wanna keep living? Because uh, my grandson is biologically female. Right. With all that goes with that, right? Uh -huh. So do I, or do, do I, do I want to choose to come out and be who I am and, and subject myself to the, to the bullying and all of that? And uh, he made that choice. I, I understand what you're yeah. saying, but from the people I know in the community, they are very upset with the word. So I'm trying not to use it or to think of it quite that way. Well, I'm, I'm suggesting, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm suggesting perhaps we could be as charitable as possible in interpreting that word choice more along the lines of the way I was thinking about it rather than- I understand, than, yeah, I yeah. understand. Um, and we can't all be current on everything that is hurtful to other people all the time. And I know that's almost impossible. But we should be sensitive when they speak up at least. Yeah, certainly it has made me decide how I describe it, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny. Thank um, you. The, I think what we have to learn to do is give people the benefit of the doubt that they don't mean bad things when they say something, they just made a mistake. And that's, that's kind of my feeling for yeah, it. I just don't know. In this case, I don't know the, if that is the, the case, but since I will never, I never actually know the answer. So I'm not going to get too involved. Right. With it. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chris, you have a question. Can you unmute yourself and go? Yeah, no, I, I was actually saying, you know, when you talk about going out and evangelizing, basically, you know, preaching atheism, they, uh, people don't mainly go to church to learn God. Not my experience. They either go for the ritual and or the socialization. And they're not going to, you know, we as atheists are not a group as such. You know, it doesn't matter what else you believe in. We just say we don't believe in that. And you can't really draw a culture of that. And it's hard even to get social things around atheism because what are you going to talk about gee i don't believe in god well that took what 10 seconds <laughs> so the rest of the time you're talking about the other stuff and you know you could be a redneck you could be a city file could be anywhere in, in the scope of society where we're in now be an atheist doesn't mean we're all going to get together and you know we don't have a common theme behind us besides the fact we don't believe in God. Don't believe in a flat earth either, but you know, well, most of us, I should rephrase, most of us probably don't believe in a flat, flat earth. <laughs> of course, there's nothing that says you can't be an atheist and believe in a flat earth. But uh, so I, you know, I, I kind of, I don't see people going to church and really giving a crap about the sermon. Uh, at least not in my experience with meeting people, I don't, they don't, you know, so to argue with somebody about the Bible, that's fine if the Jehovah's Witness comes to your door. But aside from that, you're not, it doesn't really prove anything because they go because they're in the choir. They go because they're in the senior, you know, the women's group. And that's why they stick with it because other than that, I, I, you know, the church doesn't have, you say morals, well, yeah, I think we can pretty much agree that religion and morality have nothing to do with each other. I mean, look at the history of our church. I can't say the history of uh, the Muslims talking a lot of death, destruction, and people don't care. The fact that it goes against everything they supposedly teach doesn't matter because they get the socialization they want out of it. And in certain groups like the blacks, it's been a central part of their life due to slavery and prejudice. It's the one place they could be without fear of being whipped on an ongoing basis. So I, I you know, <clears throat> to talk about evangelizing or going out and getting more atheists, I think is, 
it will happen in and of itself the more society doesn't need the church to revolve around itself. The more social programs you have, the more <clears throat> less likely you are to starve to death. Once you no longer need those things in the church, there's really no reason to go. And I think that's why you find the younger people are less likely because they have other avenues. Thank you, Chris. Um, Dan, did you want to make any comment on that? Well, I'll tell you a funny story. There was a radio talk show host uh, out of Seattle. His name was Mike Webb. Some of you might remember him back in the 90s and maybe early 2000s. And about once a year, he would have us come on the show. He called himself an agnostic and he was gay. Besides his radio talk show, he also was on a, there's a network called Gay BC. I don't know if it still exists. And so his, his show was syndicated all around the, the country on Gay BC. So about once a year, I would come on his show and we would talk about FFRF. And, and, uh, and he said, I don't understand why a gay person would want to go to church. I don't understand. What I mean, look at the way the church has treated gays. Look at what the Bible says is an abomination. And look at what Paul said. And, and, and it just doesn't make any sense. Why would you go to an organization that is oppressing you? I don't get it. And he said, so if any of you listeners out there to this radio show, if you're gay and you go to church, could you call in and tell us why? Well, some guy called in. I think his name was Bob or Bruce from New Jersey. And, 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 and Bob said, yeah, I go to church. And, and Mike said, oh, well then, okay, great. You, you're gay, right? And you go to church. So why? Why do you go to church? And Bob said, well, because, you know, there's, I have friends there and there, I interact with people and I have good feelings and, and there's community and I like the music. And, uh, and, uh, and then Mike interrupted him and said, let me ask you something, Bob. Have you ever gotten laid at that church? <laughs> and Bob said, yeah, a couple times. <laughs> and Mike said, "All right, I get it. Now I know why you're going to church. You want to be, you want to, you just want to be with people, basically." He said, "Now that's a good reason to go to church." He said, "But I thought that was so funny." He said, "Yeah, a couple times." Um, but uh, I think what you're saying there, Christopher, uh, I I think all of us kind of feel the same way. We don't want anyone telling us what to think, and we don't want us being led, you know, I, I think all of us, I think most of you here are happy and proud of the fact that we don't all think alike and we don't have to. And there's no mandate. There's no dogma or doctrine that we all must think the same things politically, or we all must think the same things about feminism, or we all must think the same things about free will or getting to, we, in fact, we enjoy the arguments. We want, you don't find that in church, usually, maybe in a Sunday school class. But we, we actually relish the fact that we don't all have to agree with everything. That's what free thought's all about. In church, you don't find that. Everybody's got a pretty much sign on the line. Here's what, your, here's what your theology is, and you're agreeing to this, and we all think the same. And Paul even said it in the Bible. Let, let there be no disagreement among you. You should all be of one mind. You should think the same thought. Of course, he didn't tell them which person's thought they should agree with. But... Um, Anyway, churches have this idea that everybody must think like a group. We, on the other hand, don't have that. We want to be free to challenge each other. You, you, you know, I hope maybe one of you will tell me I did something or said something wrong. I mean, that's healthy and that's good. Thank you. Um, Joe Reinhardt, you had your hand up. Did you want to ask or comment on something? Well, from long ago, I, I just wanted to uh, add to the comment that uh, religion was a monopoly. Uh, it's also very much like a, a pyramid scheme, uh, in my estimation. And secondly, as to uh, Richard Dawkins, I don't think people choose to be trans any more than they choose to be homosexuals. However, he refers, he starts out by referring to that woman, Dalazel, or who, who identified as black. And by that standard, you can identify as whatever you want. You can identify as a giraffe if you felt like it. Uh, and I think that that's part of the criticism that he was making, not just about trans, but about people who just simply say, well, I think I'd be better off uh, leading my chapter of the NAACP by posing as a black woman. I'm done. Thank well, you, I think, I think no matter what he might have thought at the time, 
I'm certain he's given a lot more thought to it <laughs> since then. <laughs> he's, he's, he's woke up to the fact, yeah. Um, thank you. Jenny, you have uh, something else? Um, I belong to two groups here in the Sarasota area. Um, I'm also a member of uh, the FFRF affiliate, uh, the Central Florida Free Thought Community, which I don't go to, over to Orlando, but um, they have a lot of programs that I want to participate in on Zoom. So, but anyway, our groups here, we meet at least before the pandemic, we met at least twice a month, usually at dinner time, but often at breakfast time or brunch. And we, we talk about free will. We, have, we often have uh, topics posted for dinner meetings, sometimes about free will, all kinds of things. So we do encourage uh, free thought in, in lots of areas. And it's, for us, it's, it's nice to, be, to feel safe. Um, I know parts of this, parts of this country you're, if your neighbors find out that you're not a believer, you are no longer invited to play cards uh, or, or something like that, or, or be yeah, you know, active uh, in other ways with your community. So people have uh, found our groups on Meetup and uh, are really enjoying it. And of course, we're doing everything, everything on Zoom, even our dinner meetings are on Zoom. So it's, it's been a real, uh, it's been really helpful for me to be uh, in my house and have Zoom available and to continue that social and, and just intellectual thoughts, uh, idea, sharing of ideas. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Mark Brandt. Have to unmute Mark. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Uh, I wonder if you would want to comment about uh, the social safety net and its relationship with religiosity. You talked about being in the poorer sections of Milwaukee and or poorer sections of communities and there are more churches. And it seems to me that in Europe where they have a good social safety net, uh, religion has really uh, a wane and uh, do you, do you think this uh, same thing would happen here? And is the, uh, the uh, conservative, uh, are the conservative politicians trying to minimize the social safety net, thinking that that will uh, somehow keep religion alive? There might be something to that. And there's been a lot of talk about uh, Religion thrives when people feel insecure or scared or, or like there's going to be some big tragedy happen. And when your needs are met, when society is, is functioning well, uh, like in Denmark, in the Nordic countries, maybe only 4%, I think, actually believe in God. Although about half of them will get married in the church out of just tradition. Uh, th their countries are doing so well that the churches really are not even even a part of the landscape, except for some formal things. So there might be something to that. This woman that we're helping in Milwaukee, we were there over the weekend. Um, she goes to church. And so even this morning, she, she was going to go to church this morning, but she wasn't able to apparently. She didn't have a car, actually. She was actually sleeping in her car for a long time and got frostbite over the winter. But uh, we asked, well, does your church help with stuff? Does your, doesn't your church have a community that can help you with some of your needs? I mean, I had to assemble the kids' bunk beds. I mean, there was nobody to actually do stuff for her. And, um, and she said, well, no, my mother's church used to do that. Her mother just committed suicide, by the way. My mother's church used to help out sometimes. But um, so there are some churches that are doing good. There are some churches that are communities and, and we, we applaud that. In fact, we were kind of hoping, Annie Lori and I were kind of hoping that this woman's church would be helping her more uh, so that two atheists wouldn't have to drive over from Madison to help her with set up her apartment. But um, um, some of the studies I've read uh, indicate that about 15% of the churches of America are actually engaged in what you would call charitable, actual, social things, about 15%, which is great. It's great that they're doing that. And those are the ones that you see. Those are the ones that are visible. 
But the other 85%, really, the charity is just going back to their church. It's for their pastor's salary, for the choir robes, for the missionary outreach, for that kind of stuff, for the hymn books. So people are giving to these churches, but it's basically just going back into their religion. <clears throat> so I, I kind of wish more churches would be more active. Uh, and maybe you're right, as if our society could get more, get a bigger social safety net. By the way, this woman, it's really hard when you're poor, e even when you're entitled to things, it's hard to get them. Even with, when you're entitled to unemployment in Milwaukee, it's hard to get it. Even if you get on SSI or something, it could take months before the checks actually start coming in. And it seems like the ones who are, have the greatest need have the greatest hurdles to, to cross to try to get any help in their life. So uh, if I think you're right, if there was more of that social safety net, there would probably be less of a need for people to turn to those few churches that are actually doing good social work. Thank you, Mark. I, our favorite professor, uh, Ryan Cragen, has done a lot of research on that and, and that does show that where there's the safety net, religion goes down considerably yeah. because there's no need for that kind of social services, which our government should be doing, as you stated. Uh, David Bangeness. David, you're, you're I, ask you, Dan, um, I don't think that Free Thought Radio is available in the Tampa Bay market, is it? It's not broadcast there. You have to look to you have to listen to the podcast. So you, you know, have to you have to go to our podcast link and then and then download it. Well, I do that, but um, you know, there's an independent uh, public radio station here called WMNF. Have you spoken with anybody over there about? Uh, well, I don't know if we have. Our, our director of communications has been reaching out to radio stations. Um, it's more likely to happen if you, if somebody local says, hey, I would like to hear this show, okay. especially if you're a supporter uh, of that station, call them up and say, hey, there's, here's a show you can have. And, it's, and it represents, you know what, 25% of the population is non-religious. So we call it radio for the rest of us. So right. we'd, we'd love to be on and you can... And, and in fact, we will just give them a link where they can just download the segments each week. And we right. send out a we send out a notice to their directors uh, when the when the files are ready and they can broadcast it anytime they want. Some stations do it two or three times a week. They'll broadcast the show during different times. So, yeah, that would be great. And if you do, if they do that. Uh, Give them a shout out. Say just as an aside, I was just up north for a couple of weeks in a little town called Northampton, Massachusetts. There's a big Catholic church right on the main drag downtown with a for sale sign in front of it. And uh, <laughs> another one in Holyoke in the next town over. And the funny part is that the church has put a restriction on the deed that whoever buys a property cannot put anything there that's going to be against church teachings, you know, without specifying what those are. And uh, that applies to the building, not the land. So basically what they've done is pretty much guaranteed whoever buys the property is going to tear the church down. So <laughs> I was happy to see it. That makes it, hard. That makes it harder to sell too. Um, but um, we have a semi-regular feature in our newspaper, Free Thought Today, of churches that have been converted to other use. So a lot of them have turned into restaurants. Right. Um, over in Dublin, Ireland, there's a, a bar restaurant called The Church. It was, it's, it's actually a church there across the Liffey. Um, you can walk across the Happeny <laughs> Bridge and go over there. Uh, and you can eat there right by the altar. And there's, there's that church here in Madison. It used to be, a, I forget what it was. It might've been Catholic. It's now like a restaurant. And uh, one of our sound engineers, Audrey, has actually bought a church and is converting it into a home. So we sometimes run pictures of churches that have been put to other uses, uh, to good uses. Um, what was her name? Louise Weisbrooker, I think was her name back in the 1800s, who argued that we should turn all of our churches into halls of science, you know, like museums or something. Wouldn't that be something? So if, you, if that church, uh, does, if something happens up there, let us know. That would be worth reporting. Okay, thank you. It's always been my dream to buy a church and turn it into the Atheist Community Center. Uh, Jim uh, Peterson has a well, question. It, sorry, I'm sorry, what? 
Did anybody else? Say that? They yeah. did that in Atlanta. The Atlanta, the Atlanta group uh, bought a, a small church, and they've been meeting in this for quite a while. Uh, Jim Peterson has a question. He can't raise his hand because he's right here. <laughs> Hello. Um, yes, I, 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 there goes our plans for um, uh, starting an abortion clinic out of one of those churches. I think that would be interesting. Uh, but uh, on a more serious side, I, I do want to congratulate you for the comment you made or the emphasis you put on the fact that uh, atheism, humanism, free thought is about freedom, and which is one of the things that we talk about in our uh, brochure is the fact that whereas the churches want to tell you how to dress, what to eat, uh, what holidays to observe, and in, in effect to basically control your life. And I'm speaking here mainly about the more restrictive churches like uh, uh, Islam and some of, the, um, uh, some of the Jewish sects and some of the strict Christian sects as well. Uh, but th there is that tendency to try to centralize things, including thought. And uh, the, the basic thing we could offer to the world is uh, a new sense of freedom. And, and that's what it's all about for me. And uh, it sounds like that's what it's all about for you too. Just imagine if, if Judy were to, to uh, announce that she is now the Florida Bishop of Atheism. <laughs> She and is. And here, here is our creed, and all of you have to sign this creed, and here's what we all have to agree to. Most of you would probably leave the group, right, if that happened. You don't want some top-down person telling you, here's what we all must think. Um, we, all, we all, I think it's bottom-up. None of us have to be here, do we? No. And yet we choose to because we find value in associating with like-minded rebels, I guess we could call ourselves. And rebel is a good word. So uh, yeah, the freedom to be different to, uh, you know, it, human psychology is, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to like being with somebody who's disagreeing with you about something fiercely, but that's just psychology. When I wrote my book about free will, for example, and by the way, free will is, is a contentious topic, I'm sure you all know. Philosophers don't agree, theologians don't agree, scientists don't agree. I asked Richard Dawkins if he might want to write a forward to it. And he said, nope, I'm not touching that one. I'm not touching the free will debate. He said, I got enough debate in my life. And so I sent, I sent my manuscript around before the book was published. And Jerry Coyne, you all, I think you all know Jerry Coyne, a biologist out of Chicago. He didn't like the book. And he, he really lambasted me with a whole bunch of reasons what was wrong with my book. So I put them into the book. I said, here's what Jerry says. <laughs> and let, here's, let him speak. Let his let his point of view. You rarely hear a, a preacher on Sunday morning invite an atheist or somebody else to come in to give their point of view. You never get that. But amongst us, we even if it makes us uncomfortable, the fact that we don't all agree on things, at least we welcome it. At least we tolerate each other, and we can talk to each other and listen and learn from each other. If if I'm wrong about something. It's going to be from some mistake that I have that maybe one of you can point out. So I would rather correct that than not. There's something about human ego that is hard to admit that I was wrong. But um, I've done that many times in life, especially regarding the ministry. Well, uh, unless there's another question, I do have a couple of comments and then we'll close it down because we've taken enough of Mr. Barker's time. I have one uh, quick comment. Sure, uh, absolutely. Uh, We've had Ryan Cragen, who you mentioned on our radio show before, a wonderful professor. Yes. He yes. has written some good books. Uh, it turns out he has a cousin in Alabama uh, named Randall Cragen. And Randall Cragen was the lead plaintiff in our lawsuit challenging the uh, religious right. oath to register to vote in Alabama. And we just won that lawsuit, by the way. Ah. They've, changed, they've changed the forms. <laughs> Before you could register to vote, you had to sign and swear, so help me God. And so he, he told them he could not sign that or agree to that. And so he was not allowed to register to vote. Right. So that's been changed. And Randall and Ryan knew of each other, but actually hadn't met. They were cousins who didn't really oh, have met. Really? So we put them together. So you, you cousins ought to meet each other. You're both really <laughs> smart, you know. So uh, I, Randall is now a Victoria State Church plaintiff, and his Wonderful. cousin Ryan, Ryan there in Florida, of course, is a 
a leading uh, thinker, so. Um, Jim Young has a question, but Jim, it's almost time to close. Uh, so I'll, we'll I'll make it clear. very quick. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, with respect to freedom of conscious, uh, conscience, the, that's one of my biggest gripes about religion because religion does not respect uh, individual autonomy and with respect to freedom of conscience. You either, it's their way or the highway. So you have to kowtow to whatever they tell you you have to believe. And, uh, and then the other objection, major objection that I have to religion is ethics, because I haven't found any religions that are not, uh, well, I'm talking about theist, that are uh, morally and ethically bankrupt, essentially. Well, thank yeah. you, Jim. Uh, Dan, did you want to respond to that? He said it very well. <laughs> um, I will tell you that we were contacted by a church who wanted us to come and talk with them. Uh, we agreed and we never heard from them again. <laughs> so I think they didn't think we would agree to come and talk to them. Um, so I thought that was, that was pretty funny. Um, the other thing is uh, talking about making a positive image of atheists. Uh, this morning, in fact, I just sent letters to all the legislators who voted um, on bills that we uh, either opposed or uh, they voted the correct way, so to speak. Uh, I sent them all thank you letters for upholding democracy and keeping state church separate or government religion separate. So um, we are trying to do some positive things. Oh. And one more thing is our, our neighboring county, the um, county commission just voted to have a resolution in support of National Prayer Day our National Day of Prayer. So um, it turns out that according to one site, 80% of the people in that county are not religious. They don't belong to a church. So I wrote them and asked them if they would uh, be willing to sponsor a resolution for the National Day of Reason so they could be more inclusive of their, of their whole county. And I sent them the resolution. So we'll see how that goes. I doubt that we'll do it, um, but we try to put it into, like you said, a positive mode that we, you know, we're not just criticizing, we're offering something different. Speaker next time. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much.